All right. Excited to be at church? All right, beautiful. Let's stand and sing the first song together.
Again, you may be seated. We're going to have Jerry Daniels come forward for the missions minute this morning. I'm glad that you all could make it into church Jeez. with everything going on. Very thankful that the storm passed, but please remember those who are on the East Coast there that are dealing with it. Um, keep them in prayer. Jerry? Okay, folks. Hi. How are you this morning? All right. I'll, I'll take your word for it. All right. You know, last week we talked about Rudy Johnson, one of our missionaries who just passed away about 10 days ago now. And I've been thinking a lot this week about the heroes that we have in our mission uh, family of Faith Baptist. And really, we do have some real-life, uh, present-day missionary heroes that probably someday, if, if the Lord doesn't come back soon, maybe some books will be written about them. One such hero, of course, uh, is a picture up there. Yeah, sure enough. Um, Randy and Linda Perkins. Actually, Randy spoke for us back in December just before they went back to the field. Now, they were missionaries in Australia for 40 years but, uh, or more. Uh, but then in their old age, I say old age, not all that old compared to me. They're like around 70. Uh, they decided they, they were called to the field of Vietnam. And they arrived in Vietnam just as the coronavirus pandemic shutdown happened. And they knew it was coming. They knew getting in, in fact, he emailed me and said, well, I don't know when we'll be able to get out, if we ever need to get out, but that's it, we're committed. And that, that touched me a lot, just to know that he and Linda had that kind of commitment. But I just got an email a couple of days ago that really kind of floored me to show me what kind of heroes they are. And I say heroes, it's not like they're, like they're dodging bullets. If you look at that wall, by the way, where they're standing, there are bullet holes in that wall from the war. But the war is over, the shooting war, but there's a spiritual war. And it, it, it really touched me when he said, we're studying the language. And I thought, here, for 70 years old, roughly, maybe 68, maybe 72, I don't know, but around 70, uh, why would you want to do that? It's hard. We started studying Swahili when I was 32 years old, and that's already an old man for linguistics, if you know anything about it. If you're past 30, it's really, really hard, but we knuckled down and did it. But, and I think, boy, at that age, why would he want to do that? And I know the answer because I've been counseling young missionaries over the years for my 45-year career. Learn the language. Why? So you can communicate more than just the gospel. He'll never be fluent enough to communicate John 3.16. He probably have, will memorize that. But as far as being able to preach a message, probably not. But there's just something about, hey, I love you enough to learn a few phrases in your language. And, of course, as we travel around Africa, we interact with all kinds of different tribes. And I'm, I know a dozen different uh, languages to that level. Uh, my son, Russ, even knows more. But um, it, sh it, it shows people that you love him. So I, I tell you, I'm impressed with uh, Linda and Randy. You know, he has a blood disorder. He's in that vulnerable group for people that shouldn't be exposed to the coronavirus. He has a blood, uh, like a cancer type thing in his blood, but it's in remission. And he struggles with it. I admire him. I really do. And, folks, we are blessed. And I was so blessed that I decided to add a little extra to my offering my uh, missions offering today, just because I wanted to do more for our missionaries. Amen? Aren't you glad to be in a missions-minded church? Amen. All right, thank you. In there, Jerry, before you walk there, away with there it. There you go. <laughs> you know, we have a, um, a developing missionary family over here to the side, Christopher and Melissa Spinner. They're going to be missionaries Awana missionaries to Louisiana, so they'll have to learn that language pretty soon. <laughs> but we'll be talking about them in the future. They, they've been coming to our church for a while and got married not long ago. I forget the date when, sometime before COVID-19, and we've been blessed to have them in our church family, and hopefully we'll send them off as well. Some important ministry return dates. Next Sunday, August 9th, we will reopen Little Buds and the Kids Under Construction, and by then, both rooms will have been fully disinfected, and then fogged with some kind of industrial strength, anti-COVID-19, CDC-approved, prayed-over fogging thing. I don't know what it is, but some pro's going to come in and do it. So those rooms will be completely safe for your children, and I hope that you'll consider uh, bringing them in next Sunday for the uh, morning service. The teenagers are going to continue Zooming for the meetings until August 30th is when they will begin to reconvene. The Remnant Cafe, I believe the next Saturday is August 15th, but that could be off a week. If you're interested in getting involved in 
Remnant Cafe, please call Cindy Hathaway. Then we want to thank all those of you who took part in the teacher appreciation gift giving. We had an opportunity to bless the school. Just the office is just full of pens and erasers and markers and uh, great supplies, so thank you for doing that. And then for those of you who responded to my request last week in the Daily Devos, if you'd let me know that you're watching every day and you continue, or you watch frequently and you continue to do so, we got a great response. So I appreciate that gives me some good insight into what to do uh, in the future. 2020 has been an amazing uh, and, and a freaky sort of year. You know, it began with the impeachment process, which just seemed to drag on forever. Then COVID-19 hit. Then schools are closed and businesses are closed. Our economy shut down. Families are separated where they can't see each other. Then major sports events and seasons have been canceled. Then George Floyd is murdered. Then there's massive protest. Then this strange ascendancy of Marxism via Black Lives Matter, violent riots, church services canceled or prohibited, and in some states, literally canceled, while public protests are allowed, encouraged, and applauded. And we're still three months away from the election. This has been a bizarre year. So this morning on my MSN news page, it said today experts suggest or recommend a dramatic reset and return to a complete shutdown. And then we saw in the headlines today 7,000 deaths in Florida from COVID-19. That's a high number, except when you realize there's 21.6 million people living in Florida. And that comes out to be 0.003% or 0.03%. We were told when COVID-19 began that there would be 3% death rate, which would be 648,000 in Florida alone. And I say that because things are going to get strange. Uh, I'd like for you to, when we pray today, to pray for John MacArthur. I want to say publicly, because evidently no, none of his buddies have said it, how much I appreciate and respect him holding his services last Sunday in defiance of what he deemed as a political move by the governor rather than a medical move. They did comply for a few weeks. But when it became obvious there's much more behind this story than just health, John MacArthur held his services. If you know John MacArthur, he is a law and order, submit to authority kind of guy. But he was pushed beyond that ability to abide. And I hope that you'll pray uh, for them. This morning there are some rumors that there might be some interference in their service, whether it's the power being shut off or protesters or whatever. But I don't know the right or wrong of all the imposed protocols, but I know it doesn't seem right. And it's certainly not consistent. And it has all the earmarks of political manipulation. And I'm saying that not to get you riled up, but to turn your heart to prayer, and then to make this announcement, which sort of went under the radar this week, but it's gonna pop back up over and over again between now and maybe even the election with some further announcements. But Representatives from the Pentagon and the Congress received a briefing from the Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force, which is a department of the Office of Naval Intelligence. And this briefing claimed that we are now in possession of physical evidence of what they called off-world vehicles not made on this earth. That information is going to continue to come out in more detail in the weeks and months ahead. And I'm saying that because on March 18th, on a Wednesday night, I preached a message about aliens and the end times. And I want to encourage you to go back and listen to that because it, it, it'll help frame, uh, give you a structure for which to interpret what you might be hearing in the months ahead. It's on the Wednesday night devotions. You can go to that on uh, March 18th and re-listen to it and ask God to give you a wise, faith-filled perspective on the possibility of alien life. My concern for the church is we're not ready for any kind of information like that. And the, there would be a tremendous crisis of faith. But I want you to know I do not believe that the presence of alien life, if it does exist, in any way discredits Scripture, in any way discredits the gospel, the story of God, or the sovereignty of God, or God's control over all the universe. There would certainly be a way in which life on other planets could fit into the overall portrayal of the Bible story. So go back to that day and, and don't worry, don't fret. And my concern is that as believers, with all this going on this year, 
And all that still might happen between now and the election. And then what might happen after the election that we don't, that we don't lose our faith or our commitment to what we believe and that we remain Christ-like in all we do. So let's have a word of prayer and open up this service asking God to speak to us today, uh, to be appreciative of our missionary families, and to be appreciative of one another. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great opportunity we have to meet together, and we thank you for our governor who has yet to impose the prohibition of church services. We pray that you'll bless him for that, but give us wisdom as to how we can be safe and respectful of people's health concerns, of the true threat of COVID-19, while keeping it all in perspective of our call from you to gather to worship, and that our nation needs people to worship rather than be in a panic and be in fear and be in anger and hostility and division. We need a worshiping nation. Father, I pray that you will use churches to rise up and be salt and light, and I pray for uh, Grace Community Church, John MacArthur, and the other churches in California that are meeting today in defiance of Governor Newsom's ordinance, that you will bless them with great services, protect them from any dangers, and, and give them the grace to respond like Christ should they face opposition because of their decisions. We pray for you not only to bless us, but to guide us, empower us, and use us in this very strange year we've been going through. Help us be what you want us to be, for we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let's all please stand together to sing to the Lord. Sorry. 
Jesus, I surrender, Lord, I give myself to
and Jesus, the only one who could ever save. And worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. We live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. My eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Thank you so much just for a day to be together as a church family, to worship your name, to hear your word. I pray that the songs we sing are, are just an outward reflection of what's inside, our desire to surrender our lives to you, our desire to build our lives upon the foundation that you provide us, Lord. So I pray, go heading into the message time, that our hearts would be open and receptive to your word and what you have for us, and that, God, we would listen with anticipation of the movement you're going to do in our life, the changes you're going to make, the things that we need to work on, the things that we're going to uh, reassess and become excited for. So we thank you for this time. We pray for Pastor Dave that his message comes across clear, that it impacts our lives, and that it's not just a thing that we listen to and then leave, but that we take with us. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. 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 Oh, and by the way, Jerry Daniels and Sherry, yeah, he's being humble, but you know, he's one of the heroes. 
he and his wife have served faithfully for years and have every intention of going back as soon as his leg heals and, and ministering, continuing to serve the people there. And we're uh, blessed to have uh, Jerry and Sherry Daniels with us. Um, today's message is in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 11, and it's, it's a very important challenge to every one of us. I found it to be both the most challenging and maybe the most rewarding of the challenges given to me. You can't tell by looking at me, but I was always short and stocky growing up. And uh, because of that, and being typically the redhead, um, hyper-energetic, ambitious young man, I was cheerful and happy, but there were a few times when people would do unjust things to me, in my opinion, and I had a, a hot temper. And I never actually really got in a fight. I got in a couple of wrestling matches that evidently frightened people by, from the, least, the release of rage that I had as a little kid. But my dad would tell me, and my dad's not here today, but my dad is a very gracious, kind, loving man. I've never heard him swear except one time. And he never really lost his temper. He was always composed. But he would tell me, if you're ever about to get in a fight, you strike first. Just hit him because that might be the last hit you get in. So that was in my mindset as a boy. And then I become a Christian at the age of 13. And without any real effort on my part, something happened to my, my heart. The anger went away. I, I wasn't as angry as I used to be, although I was happy. No one really knew I was angry until they pushed me. But I didn't like being pushed. I didn't like being talked against. I didn't like being insulted. I didn't like being ridiculed. I didn't like being opposed, and that was going to happen. I was going to lash out with all my little 12 and 13-year-old strength, and then I got saved at age 13. And something happened to my perspective. And it was in a radical change of life for me. I was raised in Midwest City, Oklahoma my entire life. The two homes I lived in were about two miles apart from each other. The same schools, the same friends. Up until I was 13 years old, my life was just well-wrapped in little conservative Bible Belt, Oklahoma, with all of its values. And right in the middle of that, we uproot and moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico, where everybody had long hair, everybody was doing drugs, everybody was having sex, people were different, the food was different. It was a culture shock, but right at the start of that, I became a believer. So it affected the way I, I dealt with things that developed that eighth grade year, and I'll tell you a story in a moment. But as we get to verses 8 through 11, many people think this refers to Christian brotherhood and church life instead of marriage. Even though it follows immediately after what Peter just said about marriage that we talked about last week in verses 1 through 7. So we're going to read the passage now, and you can decide if this pertains to marriage or not. 1 Peter 3, 8 through 11. Finally, all of you be of one mind having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you might inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good, let him seek peace and pursue it. So let's look at that sort of one phrase at a time. First of all, the word finally. This is a, a continuation and a conclusion of his instructions about how believers are to relate to leaders, to the community, to their masters or their employers, to their spouses, and to fellow church members. So the way to read that word finally would be this. In addition to what I've said before, also follow these principles in your relationships. Or add to those things that I've already said, these things I'm about to say. Or like in those commercials when it's about to end, those TV infomercials, and it says, wait, there's more. That finally means I'm going to add something here you need to incorporate. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 12 that you can tell a lot about a man by the way he treats his animals. A kindness. Uh, compassion, an interest in your animal is a trait of a, of a good heart. Well, if how you treat animals is important, how much more is it important to treat people a certain way? 
much of Christ's teachings focused on how we treat other people, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, the Golden Rule, which is do unto others as you would have them do unto you, that's a well-known saying today. We all know it the way Christ worded it. But in Christ's day, it wasn't stated like that. And almost every religion and every philosophy throughout the Roman Empire, there was a golden rule, and it was this. Do not do to others what you don't want done to you. Now, what's the difference? Well, one is prohibitive, and one is proactive. The common word that Christ presented, it's... Um, in Christ's day, it was prohibitive. Don't do something. Christ's words were proactive. It was do for someone. That was a, ra it was a subtle but a radical shift in what people thought was the way you're supposed to live. Because God doesn't want us only to refrain from doing bad. He wants us also to do good. So Jesus said all the prohibitive law, all the commandments of things you're not supposed to do, they all hang on the proactive foundation of love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. He said on these hang all the law. So it begins with a proactive focus, and both Peter and Paul echoed those same truths. So he's going to get to finally, this is what I want you to add. The phrase, all of you. Nobody is exempt. Citizens and servants. Husbands and wives. Male and female. Bond or free. Jew or Gentile, rich or poor, new believers and mature believers. He said, all of you in this congregation, this is for all of you, do not exempt yourself, be of one mind. Now that's a unity of purpose, a unity of vision, a unity of intent. Because when you have that, it fosters acceptance for differences. It fosters understanding of other people, and it fosters a sense of cooperation. So we are to be one mind in the gospel, one mind in the supremacy of Christ, the priority of scripture, one mind in the nature, the true nature of the church, and one mind in the call of God to love, to forgive, to submit, and to serve. So if we all commit to being submissive servants to God and to one another, we can be of one mind even if we disagree about politics, economics, and social issues. The next phrase, having compassion, demonstrating empathy, sympathy, encouragement, and service. Instead of critiquing, instead of punishing, instead of slandering, or instead of ostracizing, having compassion. And that's not just a feeling that you feel for somebody, it's a perspective of the way you view them that causes you to do something. Compassion is not just a feeling, it's a verb, it's an act, it's a way to live. You and I are to be of one mind that we're all to be compassionate and we're to love as brothers. Now that's a familial love, a family love, not rooted in passion. It's rooted in a bonding, a, a commonality, a friendship, a belonging. Very much like what athletes feel for one another when they join the same team. And then all of a sudden they, they have a bonding with the guys who are wearing the same uniform or wearing the same colors. But much more intense. We are wearing the colors of Christ. We are wearing the, the call of the gospel. I think back to 1970 when I moved away from Oklahoma and left, left behind every friend I knew and every family member except my mom, my dad, and my brother and sister. And we moved to a strange, bizarre place called Albuquerque. I left every friend behind, but I met the friend of sinners. I met the best friend I'll ever have. I met Christ. And that move away from Oklahoma was enough to break me to be open to who he was. Well, the Bible tells us we're to love each other because we all have had that experience to some degree. Whatever level of emotional intensity you've experienced when you came to Christ, you and I are brothers and sisters in Christ. We're to love like that, the same way you love family, which means we, we're to know each other, we are to accept each other, we're to understand each other, and maybe more than anything else, we should give each other the benefit of the doubt so that we're always ready to forgive. Then be tender-hearted. In the Greek, it's sort of an ugly word, eusplanknoi, 
which is a reference to the, the gut. And it means to be kind, gentle, gracious, and merciful. Then he says, be courteous. And courteous in the, in the Greek it means humble and lowly of mind, but the application is to be thoughtful, to be polite, to be considerate, to be thankful, to seek to make others more comfortable or to seek to bless others, to put others' interests before yours. That's what courteousness is. Just like you and I understand that when a man goes and opens a door for a, a lady to get into her car or a building, that's being courteous. You might want to get into the building too, but you're stopping to let that person in. That's an act of courteousness. It's a simple one. It's a social one, but it carries a very powerful message. You and I are to live by being courteous to one another. And that involves this next difficult phrase, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling. You and I are not allowed to respond to the wicked treatment or the wicked insults with insults and wicked treatment. The Bible says you're not to do that. We're not to mirror hate, anger, wrath, vengeance, ridicule, insults, or disrespect. And it's one of the most difficult things to do to refrain from retaliating when you've been wronged. It was a lesson I learned by watching my father, regardless of the instructions he told me to hit first. But after I became a believer, I, the, the Bible said this to me. And the passage where we just read has a great impact on my life on a, on a daily basis, and it began pretty early. You and I cannot control how others treat us or how others speak to us, but we can control how we treat them, how we speak to them. We can't control what they say about us, but we can control what we say about them. And let me give you a warning that probably all of you already know, but no matter how kind, how loving, how gracious, how friendly, and how polite you might be, you can still have those who do not like you, who don't respond to you well, and who don't treat you well. More than likely, it's going to be more than one. Christ was perfect, and he had lots of enemies. So I'm a new believer. I'm all excited about the Christian life. I have 30 or 40 junior high friends that are in this church, and it's all brand new to me, and I'm trying to learn the terminology and learn what it means, and I'm in this bad junior high called Jefferson Junior High where they had drug bust most days. And I remember being up on the third floor looking down and seeing police come and take people away with bongs and all sorts of... I had never even seen drugs. They, 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 they weren't in my world in Oklahoma. It was a shock. Well, there was a young man named Petey Martinez. And I was warned pretty quickly, stay away from Petey Martinez. He's a very, very bad dude. Well, Petey Martinez, Martinez and his friend Luke were in my gym class. And about the second week of the year, he and I got into it about something. And I said something funny, and everybody laughed at Petey. Nobody laughs at Petey. So we became enemies for some reason. He just did not like me. And it was gym class rivalry going on in this bizarre environment. Then one of his friends steals my lunch money. Steals my lunch money and three strips of wintergreen bubblegum that I had. And that's how I proved it was him, by the way. But anyway, he took it out of my locker. So I come to get my lunch money, and my locker's open. The money's gone, and the gum is gone. And I'm thinking, well, who could possibly do this when I see the kid with the, it was like $3.75, whatever it was I had. And I saw the gum in his hand, three strips of wintergreen. I, so I know where he got it. So I asked him to give it back, and he said no. And then he pulled out the ace card, I'm going to tell Petey. And he runs off because he was in Petey's gang. So in the middle of the school day, I get a note passed to me. Petey wants to meet you after school at a certain spot. So now it's going to go down. So I'm wrestling. I'm a new believer. I'm trying to be like Christ. I'm carrying my Bible to school. I'm praying before lunch. I want to do whatever this youth director is telling me to do. But now I've got a thug wanting to reconcile things with me. And so school ends. I walk out to the spot. I look around, and there's no Petey. 
my bus is about to leave, so I go get on my bus. I go home. I tell my mom, Mom, my lunch money was stolen today, and, and she's talked to me about that. Then um, there's a, a knock on the door, a doorbell rang. My mom went to it, and she said, uh, David, there's some friends from school here to see you. So I walked to the door, and there was Petey with five other guys on their terrorizing little bicycles, and they were doing circles right in front of our mailbox, like looking at me while they're doing it. I said, oh, no. So I said, Mom, that's, that's the guy who stole my lunch money. So my mom said, well, go out there and talk to them. Oh, what? Go out there and talk to them? Do you not see they're vicious criminals? So I walked out there. And um, I went up to Petey. I said, hey, Petey, what can I do for you? And he said, did you accuse him of stealing your lunch money? I said, yes, I did. He said, well, how do you know he took it? I said, it's because I had, I gave him the amount, and I had three strips of wintergreen gum, and it was on him. He said, so he looked at the guy, he said, empty your pockets. The guy emptied his pockets. He still had the money. He didn't even spend it. I guess he was going to invest it. He still had the money, and he still had the pieces of gum. So Petey looks at him and said, you took his lunch money? He said, well, I didn't have any. So then Petey looks at me, and he says something, because we're still not friends. So I said, Petey, think of it like this. So I, there's a girl in one of my classes. I mentioned the name of the girl. He knew who she was. And I said, I don't want to have bad, bad breath around her. You're... He took my gum that I used to not have bad breath. And he, Petey started laughing, we, and we became friends. So this guy and his little gang, over the period of the next week, we started to hang out and do things together. By the end of the school year, that entire gang came to know Christ as their Savior. Amen. That would not have been my reaction eight months earlier when I wasn't a believer. I would have gone out there and just gotten into it with them in some way, but the word of God was in my head that now I have a different call. I can't be who I used to be. Now it's incredibly hard. I've had many challenges ever since then, living by the words that we just read. Don't return reviling for reviling. And don't turn evil for evil. But if you do it, it's powerful. But that's not enough. It's not enough just to not do it. He says to do this next. But on the contrary, blessing. It's admirable to refrain from responding to evil treatment or evil words with those same, same tone and same actions. But the Lord requires more. He says, respond with kindness, graciousness, and blessings. In other words, you and I are to be kind when others are harsh, polite when they are rude, forgiving when they resent, respect when they insult, make peace when they fight, love when others hate. That's what we are supposed to be. We are, we are not to respond to the world the way it responds to us. We are to be different. But if we don't practice that, if that's not in our head, if we haven't committed to it, we are not going to do it. So he says next, knowing that you are called to this. This is not an option. It's not a, um, uh, something you can consider as a way to make your life better. You're called to it. If you take on the name of Christ, you were called to live like him. Loving, kind, and gracious treatment of others is not just an opportunity. It is a calling equal with evangelism and discipleship. Peter says you're called to it. Do it. In chapter 2, Peter wrote, To this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Jesus said, I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. If you've ever had an irritating, irregular person in your life, who just always seems to be oppositional or demeaning or dismissive, you know the challenge of not responding in kind. If you can respond with kindness, though, you are living by your calling. And then he says that you might inherit a blessing. That blessing is not salvation. You've already received that. You don't do this to gain salvation. We don't do good works to get saved, but we do good works to live in accordance with our salvation. This means to inherit the blessing of walking 
in God's favor because you've pleased him through obedience. Many of us think often just by believing something strong enough and claiming it and not doubting, that's what puts us in God's favor. What puts us in God's favor is obedience, which means to restrain from acting like them and then acting like him. That's how we walk in the favor of God. So the next phrase, he brings up a point of reason. He who would love life and see good days. That's the basic desire of most people I know, is to have a, a good life and have good days. The odds of that are much more likely if we're living by the golden rule. So he states it again. If you want to have a good life, good days, refrain your tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. What we say has great potential to bring damage. If we can't refrain our thoughts, at least we can refrain our, our lips. But we should strive on the thoughts as well. We should strive to be honest. In Proverbs, Solomon writes this, Put away from you a deceitful mouth, and put perverse lips far from you. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. He who guards his mouth preserves his life. But he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he's considered perceptive. A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calls for blows. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snares of his soul. Whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. So now we have Jesus' half-brother, James. Centuries later, adds to that by saying this, If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. Imagine how much heartache we could avoid if we could learn to control our tongue. But especially in this hostile, volatile, divisive era of America that we live in now for the church not to be like the world but to be like Christ. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Evil does not ever turn from you. You have to turn from it. And evil is not just in your path where you turn away from it. Evil is in your path and it is pursuing you. So if you don't turn from evil you're going to continue moving towards evil, and evil will continue to move towards you. You cannot keep going towards evil and do good at the same time. Let him turn away from evil and do good. So true godliness is not just avoiding evil deeds. It's practicing good deeds. Then he says this, let him seek peace and pursue it. Seek is the intent. Seek is the desire. Seek is the goal. Pursue is the energy and the effort behind the seeking. So he says, it's in your heart and mind first to want it and then take the action to get it, and it's peace. If our goal in life is peace rather than being right or being proven right, and then we do what leads to peace, we are more likely to demonstrate the graciousness that you and I have been called to. But if you wake up in the morning and you wake up looking for justice and you wake up looking for revenge and you wake up to defend number one yourself every single day, you're not ever going to know this peace that comes from laying down your arms and seeking peace and then pursuing it. But if we don't set the right goals, it's highly unlikely we'll ever reach them. So there has to be in your mind to do so. Jesus said in Matthew 5, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Paul said in Romans, If it is possible, as much as depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. So if we want to be like Christ, we need to check our motives and our intents. And then we should align our actions 
to follow the example set by Christ. That's what Peter is telling this new church, these new believers in the first century. They're, they're a, a, a melting pot of Jew and Gentile and bond and free and male and female and former pagans and former Judaizers all mixed together. And he's giving them instructions about how you ought to react to everyone around you. Colossians 4, Paul writes, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Much of modern Christianity is focused on receiving God's blessings, obtaining God's favor, being all you can be, I don't mean this to be dismissive, but uh, having your best life now, getting all out of life that you possibly can. But the New Testament focus is to be like Christ in whatever world, whatever phase of history you're living in. The gospel and the message of the New Testament applies to people who live in slavery, people who live in communist countries, people who have lived under tyrannical monarchies for centuries. This is not an American book. This is an Eastern book. This is a 2,000-year-old book. And the instructions and the emphasis is for you and I to restrain our natural impulses and be like Christ in a world that has no inclination to do that. And as we go into 2021, if we make it that far into January, our greatest focus is should be faithfulness to the Lord and His Word. And then ask him for wisdom as to how do we live that out? How do we respond to the things we see, hear, and suffer? That was the focus of the first century church. And they turned the world upside down. Imagine what we could do if we learned to live by this, just the principles of the passage we read today. To not retaliate. To show grace and kindness and love and forgiveness and even reconciliation. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you inspired Peter to write these specific, um, practical words about our relationships. Every one of us here know how difficult that is. And in every area of life, there's difficult relationships we must struggle with. And we ask you to help us to be like Christ, to honor Christ, to emulate Christ in all that we say and do. Help us to be open to the prompting of your spirit. Help us to encourage others in their Christian walk. To give them a word of, of empathy, sympathy, encouragement, to have compassion, to be courteous. Father, I pray for our fellowship of believers here that we will treat each other the way Jesus has told us to, and then we'll raise our eyes out to our community and do the same towards them. We do pray for our nation as we go through this very strange, troublesome year that appears to have many other troubling moments still remaining. Help us not to be people of fear or panic, but to be full of peace, confidence, grace, well-being, and faith and trust in you that we might be what you want us to be in a nation that desperately needs true Christianity. May you develop it in us and, and help us be faithful to you. Let me give you a moment right now, right where you're seated, just for you to silently contemplate the words of this message. If something applied to you, that you would simply acquiesce and, and tell God you will strive to follow those principles. But let me give you a moment to Talk to the Lord. Father, as we're praying, if anybody's watching online or if anybody is in the auditorium today who has never trusted in you and never had that angst, that anger, that tension, that strife removed by your spirit because they've been indwelt by him from the moment they trusted in Jesus. May 
this be the day they acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. May this be the day their spirit is made alive and they sense that new component, that, that life-changing alteration presence of the Holy Spirit because of what Jesus did on the cross. And if there's one, even today, who needs to be called to you, may they make that same decision that, that Petey did back in 1970 where this angry little young gang member came to know Christ with all of his friends. May you do that in somebody's life, even right now, while they're listening. And then help us to look for someone we can share that message with. But we ask it in Jesus' name.